Just two white guys in a podcast, as yeah. it was always supposed to be. <laughs> as it was predestined. <laughs> two white guys with microphones. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for checking out this episode of the Coconut Curry Podcast. Before we get into it, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up that the video and audio are not synced up for this episode. We had this issue in a previous episode, and we think we figured out the reason why, but weren't able to fix it for this episode. So sorry for the issues. It might be best just to listen to the audio instead of watching the video and the audio. You can find us on all platforms, Apple and Spotify for podcasts, or you could just not look at the video on YouTube. Thanks for watching and enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode 27 of the Coconut Curry Podcast. On this episode, we are going to discuss March Madness, NFL Free Agency, and the new NFL rule changes. Yes. Before we do all that, if you're new around here, we are two college students today at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm Justin. This is Peter. And we're missing Raj today, our, our third co-star here, our diversity our, hire. No, our buddy. But uh, he's out today. So it's just going to be us two chopping up about March Madness and NFL. Yes. Um, we're available on all platforms, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you can listen. And we're just a podcast talking about sports and hopefully offering a fresh new perspective. Yes. We like to toss in some personal aspects about our life as well. Please like, comment, subscribe. It helps the channel a lot. If you get this, got this far, you know, watch the whole episode. Give us that audio that audience retention rate. I would appreciate that. Even though it is what everybody feared and it is just two white guys on the mics. But you know what? We got to roll. We yep. got to do what we, we got to do. We got to do what we got to do. We got to <laughs> feed the fans. <laughs> we got to feed the family. We got to feed the fans. <laughs> we got to do what we got to do, okay? Um, reacting to comments is always the first segment yes. that we do, but we have no comments Wah! to react to. Because, oh, right. Yeah. Because the, uh, the video you got watched the last up, episode yeah. where we discussed our spring break trip to Nashville. Yeah. The video was super delayed and messed up. So I didn't want to make any clips from that. But I hope but. everyone did enjoy that. And I appreciate everyone checking out that episode because it actually got decent views. Also, I'd really, really hope that there wouldn't be a lot of negative comments on that when it's literally just us being like, hey, we had fun at spring break. So it's like, kill yourself. Well, it's like, oh, cool. Well, people probably definitely think we're idiots after some of the stories. Oh, I episode. mean, obviously. <laughs> so if, you're, if you're watching this and you haven't gone back and you would like to get more insight to our yes. personal life and how... Sometimes dumb we can all be. Oh, of course. You can go listen to We that. all share one collective brain cell, like Bluetooth, yep. and it was not One's in only Nashville. on at all times. We left it back in yep. Pittsburgh. It wasn't in Nashville. <laughs> TSA took it. <laughs> TSA took it at the check-in. Um, but the actual first segment we're going to do today is disgruntled moment of the week. Classic. Disgruntled meaning dissatisfied or angry. We talk about moments in our lives that made us disgruntled this week. It could be related to sports. It could not be related to sports. But mine this week is related to sports. Peter's heard me talk about this. My friends have oh, heard God. me talk about this a lot. I have a March Madness bracket problem. I have a yep. problem with it, yeah, and it's, it's my fault. Every year, I make a lot of March Madness brackets. You know, you want to do things different. You want to have more cracks at the perfect bracket that you're never going to get. And I realize every single year that I actually never know who I'm rooting for. <laughs> because in every bracket, you have something going on. I usually have a same victor because I want to root for one team to win the whole thing. Um, but I quickly realized that the things I say don't line up with the picks I've made and yep. the picks I made don't line up with the things I say. And suddenly my story's never straight. <laughs> For example, I was very high on Yale beating Auburn. I will say that I texted in the group chat. I said, Hey, I think Yale wins this game. They play a lot slower than Auburn does. It's going to throw them off. Auburn's going to come off this emotional high of the SEC championship game. Yale is going to get them. Right? So I said that and I made that pick in one or two brackets. And then I realized in the group chat that I said that in, that group chat's official bracket, I picked Auburn to go to the final four <laughs> because I decided, you know, I can't just have every bracket have <laughs> yeah. Yale beat Auburn. Well, now I have a pick in the group chat, a text in the group chat that states <laughs> that I think that Yale's going to win the game. I picked it in other brackets. I was confident about it, but then I picked Auburn to go to the final four in this bracket because I was trying to do things differently. And I never know my story. Like one bracket, I had Vermont beating Duke. Another bracket, I had Duke upsetting Houston. Now I don't know what to do because when yeah. when Duke won against Vermont, I was like, "What do I do? Like, <laughs> do I celebrate? Do, do I, I celebrate? <laughs> do I celebrate? Like, yeah. what, what do we do here?" Um, and it happens. It's happening all across. Like I had Purdue going to the Final Four in one bracket and Gonzaga beating Purdue. Like I have the Purdue Gonzaga matchup in every single bracket that I have, and I'm like, I don't know who I'm rooting for because in one bracket. Like, I am rooting for Gonzaga because I don't like Purdue. But, <laughs> um, like, Purdue could help me out in one bracket by making my bracket better. And then in another bracket, I need Purdue to, to win the game and I need Gonzaga to win. It's all yeah. over the place. And I've realized that this is my, like, this is an intervention for me right now. <laughs> you got to stop. <laughs> next year, I'm making one bracket. And in, no matter how many groups I do, 
I'm submitting one bracket. <laughs> All right, big dog. Let's with. see. I, it could be <laughs> terrible. It could be the perfect bracket. It could be the worst bracket you've ever seen. But at least I will have a clear rooting interest in every game, mm -hmm. in every scenario versus now. I don't like I have Iowa State winning in one bracket. I have Houston winning in two other brackets. Like that's fine. They're on opposite sides. Like you can I can generally root for what's going on over there. But it's all the like the small first round matchups where I don't actually ever know who I'm rooting for. And it's especially with the Yale Auburn thing, that's when I realized I had a problem. There we go. So I'm dissatisfied and angry and told <laughs> about how many brackets. I don't even make that many brackets, but I make enough that I don't actually know what <laughs> You don't for. even know what you're submitting. And then when I make, and then you put the financial aspect of it oh, when you're God. making sports bets, right? Example: I was high on Clemson. Now we're just getting to rant here. I'm a high. I was high on Clemson beating New Mexico because I said, "Hey, Clemson's a six seed. New Mexico's an eleven seed. It kind of seems a little bit weird to me. Everyone thinks New Mexico is going to win this game. Like that's kind of suspicious. Like I know New Mexico is like a good team, and Clemson wasn't playing well, but it still seemed a little off to me. I, I like the idea of fading New Mexico, taking Clemson just to win the game outright <laughs> as a as a higher seed. And then that that did happen, and I predicted that in some brackets. Cool. But then I parlayed a Yale victory, which happened, and New Mexico minus two and a half. Like, what are we doing here? What are we think? What, what are we like, thinking? And nothing lines up correctly, and now I just have all this like cognitive dissonance <laughs> about like, what just... I'm actually supposed to believe, and I'm in so much mental distress <laughs> because my my finances aren't in order, my ego isn't in order, and my brackets aren't in order. And There's I'm just all... so many wires crossed. You I'm just stressed don't even... out, man. I'm stressed out. I don't know what to think. <laughs> Good lord! Oh my god! Please get me off the mic. Your yeah, turn. We, we gotta get you off the mic. All right. So my disgruntled moment of the week is kind of with just like the rules of basketball in general. Now I'm a much more casual basketball fan. Hand up! I will absolutely admit that. I I can I follow it decently enough, but just watching some of these games, and I I know I'm about to sound like an old head that's like, oh, well they don't play defense anymore. But like it seems almost impossible to play defense especially in college. And like, even though, especially it seems like in college, they let them play a little bit, but like there's like the three second rule when it comes to like the restricted area, there was, okay. There was basically, there was one thing that drove me absolutely insane. It was, I forget which game this was. I think it might've been, um, I think we might've been watching Duke or somebody like that. Um, but it was, yeah, I think it was Duke, but each time that, the offense would shoot the ball. The guy would miss. The Both teams would go up for the rebound. The guy on offense would get the rebound, immediately slam himself into the other guy that's on defense, <laughs> throw it up, and get an and one every single time. And I'm like, what the hell is the defense supposed to do? Like, because they're trying to go get the rebound, but then when they get the rebound, if the other guy gets the rebound, they just have to, what, run away? And, like, make sure they can at least get the end like one. Sprinting. Just sprint away. Like, what, that seems so stupid. Like, I understand the restricted zone because you don't want people in that area, like, people coming down and stuff. Like, it may, like I understand the restricted zone, but there's got to be some, like, come on. Like, if there's a rebound there, there's got to be some sort of, like, all right, clearly they were just going up for the rebound. They can't just run away from the guy. And the guy can't just initiate contact in the restricted zone and then just get an easy and one each time. Yeah, I think there there was a lot of calls and games recently where I've, I've seen a lot of foul calls i'm just like do we need to call that it seems excessive um or even just officiating in general it's the, been terrible the a&m houston game was a game that there was i mean multiple all four of houston four of houston starters fouled out 41 free throws for a&m and Houston, even themselves, had like twenty six. There's a lot of foul calls, always in Purdue's games, or in like the um in the Oakland NC State game where it was yep. like, oh yeah, it was tipped off of some guy. It's, the ball was just nowhere near anybody on the other team, and Oakland yep. just gets the ball. That, that like, was crazy. What? Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Um, yeah, I think officiating is has been bad. It's been rough, um, and some of the fault phone call, the phone calls, foul calls yeah. have been have been suspect at at best. Yeah. So basically, I just don't understand basketball, and it makes me angry that guys. Are literally just standing there trying to not even play defense. They're just standing there. They're getting abused. I think. I think the worst part of it is when you have a big size matchup when you have like Zach Eady for Purdue mm -hmm. and just playing against guys who may have teams that might have centers who are only six eight and he's seven four. You get a lot of the like slapping on the wrist and yeah. arm crap that gets called, which is it's a fair foul call, but like it frustrates me because the other team doesn't have the personnel to even match Zach Eady because just like you can't find that many seven, four guys 
at college basketball who aren't in like big programs. Because it doesn't even give the other team a chance then. Because then it's just it's literally just like okay, who's the tallest guy that can just stand over everybody that we can just lob the ball to every yep. single time. Um, and that that's hard for me sometimes to watch because even in pro basketball, you usually have centers who are all over seven feet tall. The biggest center would be Wemby, who's like seven five, seven yeah. six. I don't think seven. I think seven five, seven yeah. four. Yeah. Um, and but you still have guys like Embiid or seven feet long wings, but I can like match up with them. You but he's them, like really big. That, like, if you I watched, mean. yeah, if you watched the Utah State and Purdue game, there's just no one on the court who could match up size wise with Zach Eady, and then you just yeah. get a lot of foul calls because people are trying just to do everything possible to eliminate eliminate the height factor. But the only thing that can really do that is getting more better players. So yeah. definitely a little bit frustrating. Not even there. better, just taller. Like literally just tall. Yep. So I don't know. I just don't understand the rules of basketball. It just seems dumb that people can't stand in that area and get yep. a rebound. Yeah. <laughs> but that's just me. I could be very off course with this, but you know, yeah, whatever. That is a scrunchal moment of the week. Yes. Unfortunately, we don't get to hear Raj's today. <sighs> All righty. So moving on here, we are going to talk about March Madness because as we kind of got into it a little bit, March Madness is a great time of the year for anybody who's in college or in high school. Like, yeah, I always remember March Madness in high school just being a super electric because you're on your phone in class, you got it under <laughs> yeah, the table. Everybody's got it. And if you go to any lectures in college, yep. everybody's <laughs> laptop has March Madness yep. up. It's so good. I've been a little bit disgruntled because March Madness games on Friday of last Friday. For, yeah. So this will come out on Wednesday or Thursday for you guys. So mm-hmm. last Friday, I'm um, at work and it's. You can't just you can't, have March you Madness can't, up while it's like rubbing a patient. Yeah, like, you can't you can't do that when you're at work. Uh, there's definitely levels to professionalism. Yeah. And so I was like, oh gosh, I can't watch March Madness. <laughs> Could you imagine if you had if you were just like in the doctor's office and then like some dude comes by with like the little cart with the screen on it? And it's just March Madness. Yep. <laughs> it's just like, oh sorry. Or like you're in the middle of rooming a patient and you're like, oh my oh god, my god. Oh my oh, god. sorry, I just got an update on my Apple Watch. Yeah. <laughs> just like watching the game on there. Um, but I remember my organic two lectures yes. during my sophomore year of of college. I was like just like not not locked in on the lecture at Glued all. Glued to the screen. Yep. Yeah. Um and in high school it's super fun. You've got your bracket, you're talking with your friends, you've got oh, it on yeah. in class, you're not paying attention to what the teacher says. Um so March Madness is always electric. But it's- we we want you to pay attention in class. Yeah, pay attention in class. That's the formal opinion of the Coconut Curry podcast. Yeah, the 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 actions of the members don't reflect <laughs> yeah. the views of the members. Uh, yes, the actions of the individual members do not reflect the organization as a whole. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> um, so um, not, March Madness is always one of my favorite times of the year just because of all the chaos. And this, this year has been ridiculous. And Well, it's always been ridiculous, but disappointingly this year for many people, not to me, um, all the one seeds, two seeds advanced, and three of the yeah. two seeds advanced. Uh, it's three, three seeds advanced. it's been like a lot of consistent upsets instead of like what feels like a bunch of big upsets and then like yep. kind of like those like middle ground ones. It was like, it felt like one and two, like any team below one and two was fair game to get eliminated immediately. Like it was, yeah. What, like what Kentucky got beat out by Oakland. Well, so we can go. Through, oh yeah. I guess we'll, we'll go, just go through. We'll just go yeah. through this. Like I'm just going to, we're going to rapid fire through some games. Yeah. You for like, we'll talk about the ones a little bit. UConn destroys Stetson. 39 yeah. point victory. Like, never a doubt. There had been some back to back one seed, like a couple one seed upsets. Like, they look like Purdue legit. last year upset yeah. by Fairleigh Dickinson. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a couple years ago, you have UAB mm-hmm. um, upset Virginia. Um, Virginia, yes. So, like, you always are checking those now because of those recent upsets. And so, 39 point blowout, nothing. You have a 9 8, whatever. You have a 5 beating a 12. It was a close game, San Diego State, UAB. Mm-hmm. Um, but UMB for the upset against Virginia, not UAB. Um, but. <laughs> You know, five pulls it out against a 12. Yale wins. That was a big upset. That was a big was, upset. Um, if people aren't aware here, um, Auburn was extremely highly ranked into this tournament. A lot of people thought they yeah. were underseeded as a four seed. Um, there was a lot of advanced metrics that suggested that Auburn was actually the fourth best team in college basketball. Yeah. Um, people would have like UConn, Houston, and Purdue top three. And, then and some people Auburn. were saying that Auburn should have yeah. been like the fourth best team in college basketball outright. And a four seed placement would indicate that they were from 12 to 16. So... In terms of overall ranking, so people thought Auburn were underseeded. People thought Auburn had a, a lot of people had Final Four runs from them, or including you, yeah, <laughs> in, in one bracket, <laughs> in other brackets. I predicted this, um, but Yale gets the upset. The nerds did it. Yep, the Yale nerds. And then a shout out to 
Pittsburgh City as a whole. Duquesne yeah. pulls off the upset against BYU. Shout out Duquesne. Um, so those were actually two of the bigger first round upsets that you look at there. Um, we never the Mormons couldn't pull it out. <sighs> Damn it, they were so close. Yep. But Illinois three seed, fourteen seed Moorhead just nail- knocks it out of the park. Moorhead really failed us with the meme names yeah. that we had. We had Oral Roberts. Yeah. We had Fairly Dickinson. We needed Moorhead. There in was this. one more too. I can't remember what it was. Well, there was St. Peter's. Was like they were a meme team. But, yeah. Um, those were the two like sus, really. sus they names, were the yeah. sus names. But like Moorhead, like come on, yep. man, it's right there. And Moorhead actually like I, I watched a lot of that game because I thought like this could be a potential yeah. upset and. They were close for most of the game, and then, and then Illinois just yeah, went on this just, crazy yeah. run and took them out of that. So anyway, Washington State 7 beats number 10 Drake. Close game right there. Um, Actually, this game was nuts because... Didn't they come back? I think Drake was, was up, up 17, I think. Yeah, it was like it was something ridiculous. It was like where, 17 with like... It might have been like eight minutes left or something like that. No, that was Dayton, Nevada. Dayton, Nevada. Yep. That's what we'll I'm, get into okay, that, different, yeah. Different D-name yeah. team. Yeah. yeah. Um, And then Iowa State 2 seed. 17-point victory against South Dakota State. So right yeah. there, you're kind of looking at the 1-2 seeds have no trouble getting through. 1-2-3 have no trouble getting through. Um, Auburn loses. That's huge. Duquesne wins. Okay, so a good mix yeah. of upsets. Everyone stays intact here. North Carolina destroys Wagner. Michigan State destroys Mississippi State. Then we have 12-5. Grand Canyon beats St. Mary's. But I would like to acknowledge here... This was a very common upset pick. I mean, yeah, there's this always was, this was like one of the bigger ones that people were like, "Yeah, this is definitely like the way that St. Mary's is playing. They could definitely beat this." Yeah, team. and like obviously every five twelve matchup, everybody knows. Even if you're a casual NCAA mm-hmm. bracket goer, um, everyone knows that the five twelve is where you predict a lot of upsets here. But Grand Canyon was, I think they might have been four and a half point, five and a half point dogs for this game. Yeah, a lot of experts thought Grand Canyon would get like this was not an outcome that people were shocked to see. So even when we say like a 12 seed beat a five, it's, it doesn't feel like yeah. even at four thirteen for the Yale Auburn was a lot more shocking than a five twelve upset here. Yep. Uh, Alabama beats Charleston Clemson. And we'll talk about Clemson a little bit. Clemson six beats 11, New Mexico, Baylor three wins. Dayton Nav- Nevada was a crazy that game. That was the crazy game. Um, yeah. Nevada's up 17 points with like seven minutes and left. Blew Dayton blew that come back, dude. back. Um, and then Arizona wins. So even then, we got a two seed advance, a seven seed, three, six, four. The only upset, really, because Miss- Michigan State was favored against Mississippi State, yep. um, was Grand Canyon winning, which again, it was something many people predicted. So not a crazy bracket there. Texas advances, Tennessee advances. That's a two seven. Creighton goes. Oregon does beat South Carolina in 11 6 match. But again, 11 6s yep. are close. But Oregon was also one of those teams that was like, they got a lot of firepower on that team, so they definitely could pull it off. Yep. Kansas gets through in a Sanford game that people thought that could have been close. Gonzaga gets through. Utah State 8 gets through. Purdue gets through after destroying Grambling State. Um, nothing shocking there. Then Marquette gets through. Colorado beats Florida. That was that was nuts. And here's a little bit where some drama happened and some March Madness legends have been born. Oh, Oakland takes down there Northern it is. Kentucky. This was the this was the big upset of of the tournament because o- Oakland, a team nobody even knew where Oakland was from. Because Oakland, not Oakland, California, not Oakland, the suburb in Pittsburgh where we live. O- Oakland in Rochester, not in New York, Michigan. Again. <laughs> what <laughs> um and they've just got like and we'll talk about jack Golke. yeah uh, but they make a huge upset here yeah and then nc state the 11 seed who that was, won the yeah. acc tournament five games in five days yeah what in. they had a, they had like a four game losing streak and then they, they've won like seven straight yep, now. seven straight now and so they take down texas tech so those were 11 and 14 seeds advancing that was huge yeah uh duke takes down vermont no problem James Madison, again, a 12-5 matchup, but everybody, everybody thought, thought Wisconsin was losing. James Madison could yeah. win that game. Like very, like very some Even these games that there were upsets, yeah. the only one that was really shocking was Yale-Auburn. Like mm-hmm. A lot of people predicted this type of stuff. A&M gets through. Houston gets through. No problem. So I go through all that to say there weren't that many crazy upsets. Because but there just seemed like there was there was more, but they weren't as ridiculous as they have been in the past. Because then you can go through the next round, which this might be horrible to listen to. Um, but you have the one seed Houston advance, the four seed Duke advance. You have an eleven fourteen matchup, or the eleven seed advances, <laughs> the two seed advances. So now we got a one, two, four, and eleven seed. Yeah. In 
the Sweet 16 up in the South region. That's not shocking. Yeah. Like, you have an 11 seed. A, a Cinderella team always snakes through. Um, again, you had 14. But then it's like one, two, one, three. Yep. <laughs> like... so then, go, then we go over to the uh, the Midwest region. One Purdue versus five Gonzaga. All Four right. or five matchups. Yeah. No one cares. Um, two Tennessee, three Creighton. Okay. I know that Creighton Oregon game was crazy. Yeah. Double overtime. That was um, And Creighton destroyed him in overtime. That was nuts. <laughs> that was but, ridiculous. But no matter the outcome is still one, two, three, five in that conference. Nothing, nothing yeah. crazy there. Go over to the West. One four, North Carolina, Alabama, two six. There, so you go. Wow, we got a six, six seed. Holy yeah, crap! Oh, wow, big big whoop de doo. We got a six yeah. seed that uh, sneaks through a little bit. Like that's not su- nothing super crazy about that. And then you go up to the uh, the East region. One UConn, five San Diego State, two Iowa State, three Illinois. So really, you have all the players, um, all the good teams there. Yeah, and. For me, as a fan of basketball, I know a little bit more about basketball than I do, like s- schematically than football. I love this because I want to see just good basketball. I want to see good upcoming games of basketball versus there's the potential. Now I know teams get there for a reason, but let's say Grand Canyon has beats Alabama and we got North Carolina Grand Canyon. Do I am I interested in seeing a potential like annihilation? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's fair. I mean, like I do love the Cinderella runs, but like. It always comes to a crashing halt. Like as like I love that it's like you know they can go like so far, but it's like they're gonna crash and burn. Like that's the entire point. Like you're just going up against like teams that just have so much more talent. It's just it's in like the odds of you not only winning like a game against like one upset, then you got to get another upset, then another, then another. But the issue is that. The more you're in these games, the more film these teams have to watch, yep. the more they're like, okay, well, now we can actually game plan against them. We know how to scheme. We know what they're going to do versus you look at a team like North Carolina and it's like, well, you know what they're going to do. You just can't stop. Them. Yeah. You're just not talented enough. Yeah. And, and yeah, so I think it's really well said. Um, this is a lesson to everybody who probably, you're probably not watching this podcast, but if you are, this is a lesson that when you pick four seeds, five seeds, some more dark horses to make big runs. If you want to win your bracket, you might be better off just sticking to the one and two seeds because they're all there. They're all there. They're all there. <laughs> um, so that was just a really run down the bracket just to say that there have not been a crazy amount of upsets. But I, It was like that first round felt like there was a bunch of them, but then it's like after that, none. That was it. There was a crazy stretch where there was like every favorite one except for Baylor. Yeah. Yeah, it was ridiculous. It was like every single one. It was like favorite, 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 favorite. They were like 20 and 0 or something like that at one point. It's like, why am I watching this? Like, also, here, shout out B. John Robinson. What oh, yeah. Ele- what an electric day one. <laughs> yeah, he had he had a perfect bracket. He was like one of the last people with a perfect bracket. Yeah, shout out Just to leg- the Falcons leg- running back. <laughs> yeah, legend, legendary run right there. Yeah. Um, I did want to no- touch on NC State um, having an absolutely fantastic run. Oh, yeah. Uh, plug in the charger. Oh, did it on plug? Yeah. All right. Oh, I think it pulled out. That's what. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. <laughs> no, I was about to say that's what she said. Uh, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll call you right away. Hooray. That's better. Christ, this podcast of technical issues. So going forward, NC State continues their legendary run. We've got seven seven straight wins for them. Yeah. Um, they go five again, five for five for the ACC tournament. And then they take down six Texas Tech in this tournament. And then they go out and beat Oakland in a overtime game that was really That was fun, a really fun game. Really to fun watch. game to watch. We were watching yeah. it together and it was it was a fun game. Just I mean, watching their team, they've 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 it's kind of been dominant. They didn't really face a ton of like pressure in the ACC tournament. They won a lot of those games by big. They took care of Texas Tech by 13 points. And Oakland, I mean, of course, they beat Carolina. Overtime. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> I think if there is a year that we see an 11 seed, like kind go of, deep, like uh, the lowest seed or highest seed to win the NCAA tournament is Villanova at eight. Yeah. Um, which was so many odd years ago. And I think of that the next team, right? This NC State t- team has the tools because of the win against North Carolina. Yeah. Um, and just what they've been able to accomplish. Like, I don't know what that line is against Marquette. They're not favored to beat Marquette, 
but they but, beat UNC, they can beat Marquette. Yeah, like and, I can definitely see it. And if they go forward into Duke, they beat Duke yeah. in the tournament. Um, so they would have that matchup favored there. So mm-hmm. there's just a lot of interesting things here where I'm like, there could be some. <laughs> I I am not betting them to beat but... Marquette, and I am not beating them to w- betting them to win the tournament. But it could happen. It could happen. <laughs> Um, so I really impressive there. They've got the center who, of course, a little bit on the heftier side, um, in the media. <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal. Yeah. And the media loves him. Shout out DJ Burns. Yeah. Uh, just having a great, great run. The yeah. last, uh, this, I mean, this is what March is about, right? Yeah. It's um, like, it's just about the weird crap that happens. Like the weird random players that come out of nowhere that everybody falls in love with. Yeah. And like, I think like, it really shows that, like the talent that is oh, available yeah. at the NCAA level. Like you don't hear about these players during the regular season. Yeah. They get overshadowed by Guys like Zach Eady, who can win oh, player yeah. of the year. Uh, Flip Kowski plays for. Or like Duke. everybody on Kentucky. Yep. That then gets overshadowed by some accounting major <laughs> with like the worst hairline Widow's you've Duke, ever yeah. seen. Dropping 10 threes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can really have these guys shine in the tournament, oh, which yeah. is just awesome to see. And TJ Burns is one of those and somebody people will be looking for yeah. um, during that next round matchup this upcoming Thursday and Friday. Mm-hmm. And then moving forward to the next topic of discussion in March Madness is I personally wanted to give a round of applause to Clemson. Clemson, and we talked about a little bit, underdogs as a 6-11 matchup. Crazy. Two and a half dogs against New Mexico. They win. Yeah. Convincingly. Dogs against Baylor, three seed, win convincingly. And this is a team that expert and people were thinking everybody was not going to make it out of the yeah. first round yep. and now they're in the sweet 16 which for their school is for big. their program yeah. it, it is really big um and just like i don't if you're a six seed and your favorite twin and you lose you go ah you know they got us but they were yeah. they were underdogs as the six seed mm-hmm. and that's like it's unheard of i've never really seen that before yeah that was and, ridiculous and that first game they really like they they won that game by a huge margin and I think that just is a really testament to the coaching staff. They won by nine, uh, 21 points. They used it as motivation, that yep. underdog uh, mentality. And yeah, because to like have that underdog mentality as a six seed is dangerous. Yeah, like, because like for literally four the talents there. Because exactly the talent is clearly there if they're a six seed, and then for everybody to be counting them out, it's like yeah, it's us against the world. We have the talent. We know we have it. Yeah, so I like, I just I think it's super cool. Like, yeah. I don't really like Clemson as an ACC team. Yeah. Um, right now, get, with Pitt getting snubbed out of the tournament yeah, and whatever. everything like that, but yeah, Virginia being absolute booty, yeah, but, but whatever. In in alliance with the ACC a little bit, exactly. I'm I'm happy to see Clemson really silence some doubters this run and, and yeah. make it to the Sweet 16 when they were underdogs both times. Yeah. Um. When again, they should have kind of been favored as a six mm-hmm. seed. Um. So that that's special to them. And also, just shut up the ACC in general. They were yeah. doing. They've been doing pretty well in this tournament. Yep. And also, <laughs> the SEC. <laughs> That commissioner is such an ass. You were like, oh, why are we letting these other teams in? Because we have better talent. You went one for five in the bracket, okay? First round, half your, almost all of your teams got eliminated. You're garbage, all right? Yeah. Stick to football. Basketball is ours. Yeah, Duke, NC State, Clemson, North Carolina all come through here um, to the Sweet 16. That's 25% representation here, yeah. there. And you've got for the SEC... Bama. Tennessee, and Tennessee, Tennessee and Bama. Yeah, and I think ten, I think Alabama might be seeing a quick ride home back to uh, where they play Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa. Yeah, uh, they'll be seeing a quick ride back there against North Carolina. Oh, yeah, sorry, I guess two for f- whatever. Yeah, but it's, it's just not a great look. Um, Pitt got snubbed. Pitt absolutely got snubbed, and so, well, there was a bunch. There was some uh, some other Big East schools that also got snubbed. Yeah, there were a lot of snubs. I think. What's hard about the March Madness tournament is the 64 best teams don't get in. It's just not going to happen. And I, don't, I think that's not the point of March Madness. I do wonder if there's a way that we can. I don't, I don't think we should expand the tournament. That's been a debate. No, Maybe that's, that's a topic dude, for a different day. Actually, <laughs> let's just do it now. Should the tournament expand? <laughs> no. No. Um, anyway. <laughs> 112 teams or 108 or whatever. The that's ridiculous. Was, sounds ridiculous. Um, I guess they're saying 100 and maybe 16 or whatever for more for sure. No. Anyway, it's dumb. You would just see more annihilate because, like, I would say, like, there's 30, 40, 30, I don't know, the quick math, but like 30 teams maybe Ish, that yeah. should are better than certain teams that are in. 
but they don't get in because they didn't win their conference or, yeah. or whatnot. Like Pitt, for example. And like, you know, but then that's the thing is like that's just kind of part of it though. It's like that is part of it. Yeah. And I'm okay if we can try to think of ways to like negate that. Like, mm-hmm. it should Stetson get in for whatever like, reason versus a team like Pitt? Like, it doesn't really seem fair. Yeah. But a hundred. Plus, we're gonna get some bozos in here who are gonna get whacked around. Like, it's it's literally gonna be the equivalent of like that team's equipment manager playing against like Division One well, opponents. Here, like, the, the quick logic here is like Wagner played Howard in a first four game. Wagner won by three points, so they got the invitation to go play North Carolina, where they got smacked by thirty eight points. So, oh, sorry, twenty eight points. So the question is, do you want Howard to play against like a two seed, like Arizona, where they could against gotten smacked by yeah, twenty five like... points? Like it's not it's not very productive, and I think I don't agree with the if it ain't broke don't fix it mentality. I think there is time yeah. to still make tweaks, but Mark Madness is extremely popular. It's extremely fun. It already goes pretty long. Like we have this weekend, this upcoming weekend, and there'll be another weekend after that of games. So it's like mm-hmm. three straight weeks of games. I don't think we need to go to four or five weeks for March Madness. I'm, keep it where it is. We don't need to see Montana State as an actual, like, legit tournament team who doesn't have to play a first yeah, four Yeah, I don't want to see UNC go up against North Dakota mm-hmm. State and just demolish them. Like, yeah. no one wants to see that. I prefer to find ways where we could get 10 seed Boise State who played Colorado in a first four game. Can we get them into the tournament as a solidified team? Can we get Virginia as an, I know I don't like Virginia, but can we get them in as a solid team? Can we get Pitt in as a solid team? Can we get these teams that Do you hear that? Yeah. I've been hearing that for a little bit. I don't know what that is. Uh, something's weird here. Whatever. All right. Um, anyway, anyway. This, this house is haunted. All right. Yep. Moving on. Uh, wanted to talk about UConn. Dominant run so far. They've just handled the first two opponents. Um, team favor to win. Everybody's picking them to win the tournament as a yeah. whole and they've just been dominant so far it's cool speaking of uh, like martial legends jack golke yeah plays for oakland i'd be remiss if i didn't talk about him just dog third like only shoots threes D- this man does not sniff the paint does <laughs> all his his only goal is to shoot threes and he did a great job against kentucky having like 30 points for them gets an nil nil deal with turbo tax yep. and buffalo wild wings and has made himself a ton of money. Yeah. March legend. I mean, this is just, it's just really fun, March Madness, when these legends are born. You don't, in the NBA, they're already legends. Yeah. Um, when they come into, like, they, their name's household name. When you get to the playoffs, maybe some other guys get a little bit more recognition. You know, Andrew Wiggins, when the Warriors and Celtics yep. played, yep. got a lot more recognition. But March is where people who you had no idea existed just become come out really of cool. Yeah. And Jack Golke did that. He is, the, he is the meme character of this year's March Madness. And I love it. I love it. It's It was so funny. Because, like, watching it back, like, uh, I've seen some, like, film breakdowns and stuff. About, like, Kentucky had some, like, awful coaching uh, during shocker. that game. Which, I know, shocker, right? But also, like, people were just like, watching it. It's like, what, what are you supposed to do against that? Where he's coming, like, full speed off of a screen catches it doesn't even dribble just turns shoots like a 35 footer and it's just nothing but net it's like there's cash, nothing you can, just just absolute cash every time it's like what what do you like even the, i think the kentucky coach at one point was like like what am i what yeah. am i supposed to tell him to do like and everything that comes out about him his pregame ritual, no layups, <laughs> just no only layups. Three, only shooting. Yeah, he like d- that the day of the game. He shoots like he goes out like before the team's even out there. Shoots two hundred and fifty threes. Then comes back during during team shoots five hundred shots. So he's shooting seven hundred and fifty threes before he even steps onto the Which court. Which is crazy because this kid plays in a bad D one bro. Like. <laughs> He was like D two like a, like yeah. a couple of years ago, and then now it's like oh yeah, we'll bring you over to Oakland, and then they're like all right, we're in the tournament. Eddie DeMarch legend, just oh my god, awesome, awesome thing uh, to see there. And then I did want to do a quick just because you know we can. Let's predict the next round games. Oh god, Rapid fire! All, all right. right, UConn, San Diego State, UConn. Yep, taking UConn here. I don't think UConn. They're just all the way. Iowa State, Illinois. Uh, what are the seeds? Oh, you know what? Iowa State. I took Iowa State to win the tournament in our bracket. I have loved what I've seen out of Illinois. 
Can you have more cognitive dissonance at this point? Good lord. I listen, I've watched the tape. I've watched Illinois play. I'm really impressed with what, what they've been able to do, so I'm going to take Illinois in this game. Fine. North Carolina, Alabama. North Carolina. I hate being like, oh, we're just going to take the, the one seed, but yeah. it, North Carolina wins. Clemson, Arizona. Arizona. I'm going to take Clemson. You're going to take Clemson. You know what? I'll ride with the ACC. Give me Clemson. Give me Clemson. Yeah. Um, I think Clemson plays at a lot slower pace than Arizona plays at. And I think Clemson's got a little bit of this dog in them yeah, here. I Arizona's known to be a team that kind of bows out of the tournament early. And I just mm. wonder if yeah. Clemson, kind of with yeah. the underdog role a little bit. I know they've played above their heads in two games, but underdog role a little bit. Get, slow the game down a little bit. Get Arizona out of their wheelhouse. Yeah. They did only beat Dayton by 10. Um, which I don't remember what the line was for that game, but I just wonder if like Clemson can continue this big run they have here. You've convinced me. Yeah. Creighton, Tennessee. Going to be a fantastic game. Give me Creighton. Yeah, I was going to say, give me Creighton as well. I think, uh, they. I mean, Tennessee has looked good, not offensively explosive. I think that Oregon game is just a big like confidence boost for Creighton to get out of there. To go to double OT and then dominate Oregon in that second period. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yep. Purdue, Gonzaga. I don't want to pick Purdue. <laughs> I really don't. I hate Zach Edgy or whatever is the last. Eddie. Edie. I hate him. I don't hate him as a person. He's just, I just hate the way he plays. He's just, he's literally just big. That's, yep. his, that's his thing. He's just big. <sighs> you know what? No, I'm not going to pick them. Give me it, Zaka. I hate him. <laughs> I've had a lot of like conflicting stuff about this because I don't want Purdue to win. I want Gonzaga to win. I think Gonzaga Purdue. could pull off the upset. You're gonna take Purdue, but I'm gonna take Purdue. You're gonna take Purdue here. I, I do. I think the upset possibility exists. Yes, um, Gonzaga has more tools here to deal with Zach Eady. I think Purdue's gonna kind of gotten caught a little bit in these first couple games, like only going through Zach Eady because they're able to, which is great. But if that doesn't work. They haven't really had to go to much other stuff, and will they be able to? But I just and Gonzaga has been impressive, but I think Purdue has a lot of talent I'm, on that team. I'm picking Gonzaga out of spite. I don't think they're gonna win. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna take Purdue. I think they're a good team here, but uh, and I will take if Purdue and Gonzaga and Creighton do end up being the matchup. I will take Creighton in that matchup, but um, I don't think that Gonzaga gets the job done here. I think they've kind of reached that yeah. line for them. But I again, I can see the upset happening. Marquette, NC State. I really want to ride with the ACC. I don't know. Give me NC State. Give All right, NC convince State. convince me for NC State. <laughs> That's it. That's the. I mean, they could. I can tell you, they've won their last seven games. <laughs> Eight straight. Give me NC State. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, Give me Shaquille O'Meal with fifty. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I that could go south, but I just think, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I just think I'll pull it out. Come there. on. And then Houston Duke. The Wolf Pack. What? Houston Duke. Oh. Um. I'm gonna take Duke. Does is Houston injured? They're a little bit. I mean, they just a little banged up. Yeah. I'm gonna. Get, I'm gonna take Duke. I'll take Houston. I don't like Duke, even as much as I ride with ACC. I just don't like Duke. Mm. Um, I I think yeah, Houston game against A and M is either going to be a wake up call or it's a sign that Duke might be able to take advantage of some of the things there. I, True. Duke was dominant against JMU. Yeah, and uh, they played. I mean, it was a weird, weird Vermont game, but they ended up getting the job done. By is Phil Kapowski playing after he nearly died by that fan? Yeah, yeah he nearly yeah. got killed. He is going to play. Wow, that's that's really that's really admirable yeah. of him that he's able to throw down uh, dunks and be able to jump off that leg that nearly had to get amputated yeah. after that fan bumped into him. That's really admirable. Yeah, he's, he's a brave man. So soft. Um, any thoughts on you picked UConn to win tournament? Uh, I actually picked Iowa State oh, okay. te technically, but I have no faith in them at this point. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I th I think UConn, the way that they've been looking, I think they easily could. Um, yeah, my confidence has uh, shifted over to UConn. Yeah. Um, I still think they won't win because I don't think a team will go back to back. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's so hard to go back to back. But I'm a little bit more nervous about Houston right now. Purdue, I just don't know if they're going to get the job done there. No. North Carolina could win, but again, they lost to NC State. I don't want North Carolina to win because I think that one guy's ugly and annoying. 
I'm their feel- center. <laughs> they got. I don't like. He's like 27. Yeah, he's, he's like got, he's um, like flexing on a kid that's like 18. Yeah. It's like, bro, get a job. Yeah. Like, uh, I love I love Illinois. Been loving Illinois. Him. Yeah, Illinois, but they could just good. lose Iowa State yeah. and all this will be for nothing. Also, I, cr- what crazy turnaround for Illinois that they got bounced by Pitt last year and then are yeah. just like literally a three seed that are so good this year. Yeah, Illinois has been Illinois has been great. Uh, I've been watching their games, like I said, and I just think they've looked great in all those games. So shout out to Illinois. I'm kind of riding with them right now. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's a lot of March Madness talk. Um, looking forward to breaking down the weekends. Yes. Action. It's fun because we'll have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday yeah. games. And then we get to come here on Tuesday and just evaluate everything. Just everything. Eight yeah. team, six, four teams. Yeah. Four teams. Yeah. It goes by fast. Yeah. Um, what we didn't get to do last week, oh, go God. through NFL free agency. There's so many. There are so much, and I don't know if we're going to ever have the time to get through all we want to talk about. I We just we got to stick to the notable ones. If so, if you can leave them in the comments, if there's somebody that we miss, we, we j- we'll there's bring them up next episode. so much going on. This year, I feel like this year more than others, there's just people moving everywhere. Yeah, there's a lot of movement. A lot of movement. I think a lot of people feel like they're kind of in the hunt, so they're vying for a position, getting yeah. maybe a QB to like take them up one more step. Pittsburgh. Um, <laughs> and and there's a lot of other teams just doing these small shifts on the edges. Yep. So let's start off. What I view as probably the biggest move of the free agency is Kirk Cousins going to the Atlanta Falcons. Yep. They got the, the Mr. Game Manager, and that's not a chirp. That's like he's just good and like controls the ball. Um, to a team that has so many weapons on it, yeah, that has been so ass for no reason on offense specifically. Yeah, it's really exciting. Yeah, like I, they, I think, finally to our fantasy owners that want to draft Kyle Pitts, I think this might be the this year. Is the year to draft him. I think maybe, although he did say that. I guess Kirk Cousins was joking with Kyle Pitts that is like, oh, well, like, I want to give you something for the number the number eight. And Kyle Pitts is like, oh, well, you could just give me targets so that Kirk Cousins didn't take his number. <laughs> so he might be screwed, but I think Kirk Cousins will throw it to, like, his six foot six tight end that can run, like, a 4-4. Four four. Yeah. I'm just a wild guess out here. Yeah, so, and they also signed Darnell Mooney. So right now you've got yes. Drake London, Darnell Mooney, Kyle, Kyle Pitts, B. John, John Robinson, Robinson, Tyler Algier. Tyler Algier. Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins. That's a pretty solid. They offense. have a good offensive line. They got. They have one of the best run blocking offensive lines in yeah. the league. So, and they have a high draft pick, which they could use on a lot of different targets. High we, draft pick. We could talk about Ro- Ro- Roma Dunze. We could talk about Malik Neighbors. Brian. I think they got to go defense. I think they're going to go defense as well. Yeah. But um, but I mean, they could go like Jalen Verse. The only question is, and this Verse. always brings up the Jared Verse. Yeah. Um, Jaylen, or uh, what's from. his face from Alabama? Uh, Dallas Turner. Dallas Turner. Yeah. Yep. Um. I think what's interesting is when you get a defensive head coach in the room, they might feel more confident they can get defensive studs in the second yep. and third round here and use a high pick on offense. Because like they know it's like, okay, this is guaranteed. We can kind of write that off. I know I can scout good defenders later on because yeah. I know what it takes. Mm, exactly. Yeah. Um, just do you think the Fal- this puts the Falcons over the edge? <sighs> well, because my, my thing is, is that w- who's in their division? It's Carolina... Tampa Falcons Saints Saints I think the Saints are still treading water they've been treading they, water forever they clearly have the most dynamic offense in that on oh paper, yeah on, on paper they they have the most dynamic offense I think they the team to beat still is Tampa Bay just because they're more balanced overall I think the Saints are just like such a weird team because like they're just like fine forever and like they didn't they release Michael Thomas like I don't think Did he's they? or something like that. Like they're like I don't know. I don't know if he's playing this year or something. There's something up with him. Um, but like their offense is like Alvin Kamara, um, and like Chris Olave. Yeah, he's an ex Saint. Yeah, ex Saint. Yeah. So like it's Alvin Kamara, Chris Olave, and what Derek Carr. Yep. Like that's their offense and their defense is like pretty solid. They have um, Cam Jordan. They have uh, Demario Davis. Um, they got Marcus Lattimore. Uh, they got the Honey Badger still. Yeah, like it's like yeah, I can sit here and list off names, but like none of that really convinces me that it's like it's they're any di- they're the same team. Yep, 
Like nothing, I, nothing's changed. Yeah. They didn't sign anybody really. I have no notable. reason to believe their team's going to be any different next year. Than uh, last year. Ryan Rams check their one of their tackles might be out for the season. Mm-hmm. Um, they might actually have to cut him at this point because he's just not going to be able to play. Um, it's like they're just going to be second in that division. I feel like until something changes. Yep, I agree. Until something really, really changes, they're going to be second. The Bucks are still the team to beat because they got a lot of young talent on that defense. Um, they did just Shadow lose. Shadow Kalaja Kansi. Shadow Kalaja Kansi. They did just lose uh, Devin White. Although Devin White is a good linebacker, I don't know if he's a great linebacker. Of course, for the Eagles, that's all they need. Yeah, <laughs> they just need something. <laughs> they need anything. But, I was gonna say. I was gonna <laughs> look, say. look, exactly. So I think, um, especially with um, Levante David still there, I think they can still build up. Um, they can still build a linebacking core uh, with him there, kind of as almost like a coach on the field sort of thing. Baker is going to be there. They got uh, Mike Evans is going to be back. Um, they got Chris Godwin there. Like it's going to, they're still going to be solid. Yeah, it's still going to be a solid, solid team. So I do think the Falcons have the potential to beat them out in that division. I have no idea if they're actually going to do it because it's the Falcons and they can always choke it away at any point in any game. <laughs> so no matter what, no matter what. So. I, we'll, we'll need to see. I know it's a boring ass answer, but like we'll need to see. But for right now, I will say that the Falcons are going to win that division. Fair enough. Yes, um, I, I like the Falcons to win that division. And the well. Panthers suck, so they're irrelevant. Yep. <laughs> um, next move was uh, Derrick Henry to the Ravens. That's perfect. Like that's a perfect fit. Yes, big of a fan. Okay. Well, why? For the Ravens, I feel like their identity has been. We actually don't really have a good running back. Like, Lamar is our running back. And they do go through the run game, but part of the dynamic part is you don't know if, like, Lamar is going to run or Derrick Henry is going to run. Not Lamar. Derrick Henry's on the team. You don't know if Lamar is <laughs> going to run or if the running back is going to run. Yeah. And I do wonder if this, like, simplifies their offense a little too much. And you're paying a running back a lot of money. It's not a lot of money, but you're paying a running back significant money. Yeah. And I don't love that. Mm-hmm. And Derrick Henry, um, it's the first time off the Titans. Right, hmm? first team off. He's yeah, 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 yeah. First team off the Titans. Um, didn't have like a fantastic year last year. Maybe coming down, declining a little yeah. bit as an athlete. Um, I just wonder if if the Ravens cared a little bit too much about getting the splashier move instead of just building around their team and making it better. Like I still think wide receivers a need from that for them. They lost some defensive talent, so I like it. I'm not sure if I love it. I personally, I really do like it because for a little while now, or at least since Lamar Jackson has been the starter of that team, they've really changed their identity because before you had Joe Flacco, they were very like, you know, pass heavy offense. Um, They still had some decent running backs like Ray Rice, Um, but (laughs) we don't speak his name, Um, (laughs) but it was much more, you know, pass focused and all that. But then once Lamar really started to shine, they switched the offense to lean into what his strengths were. And that was one of the best things they ever did. You know, they've made an AFC championship game. They've been, they made multiple AFC championship games. They uh, went deep in the playoffs a couple of times. They've been a very, very good team. And I think now the idea of the, the one thing that's been hurting the Ravens uh, RPO, um, the run pass option, um, is that no one really feared the running back that Lamar was handing the ball to. Because Lamar is very elusive, but he's also gotten a lot smarter where he doesn't try to get that extra yard or whatever, and he goes down a lot more, so that way he can extend his career, which very smart. Like, don't get me wrong. Um, but now you kind of have that, like, big, bruising like guy that's like, all right, you're going to need to run up the gut and meet Derrick Henry in the middle, who's... Six foot three, two hundred and fifty pounds. that can run a four yeah, four. Gonna run you over. Like who's gonna like hit you like a truck? So it's like, all right, you're either gonna get hit by a truck, or you're gonna get shaken out of your shoes, or Lamar's gonna lob it over your head to uh, Zay Flowers, who's streaking across the field. So I think that he's what across the field streaking. All right, calm down, <laughs> settle down here. <laughs> um, but. That's, I think, going to be like their big kind of game plan uh, for like this next upcoming season because now they really have um, a threat when it comes to that run pass option because like they kind of did running back by committee for a little while now and like it's worked fine, but when it worked at its best, that was when um, 
Marvin Ingram. Marvin Ingram? Yeah. Why I, no, I was thinking of um, Marv, Melvin Gordon for some reason. I don't know why. I was like, that's not him. But he, wait, he was on that team at one point. Hang on. I was right. Um, but uh, when Marvin Ingram was uh, was um, much better than he was, I guess, now, um, that's really when the, uh, the 2019 Ravens team, when they were incredible, Lamar was the unanimous MVP. Um, when they lost in the first round. Ignoring that. <laughs> um, but that's really where that offense was at its best. Um, so I do, I do really like the fit. Um, they do have other needs that they need to fill. Um, they did, um, lose Patrick queen. They did, uh, lose some guys on defense. They were able to sign one of their young defensive tackles. They got some holes to fill. I think it's a really good fit for their offense, but of course we got to see. Um, yeah. What works. I do like is it definitely puts emphasis on extending Lamar Jackson's career and yeah. reducing injuries, and you're going to hand off some more snaps exactly. to Derrick Henry, yeah. and I do think that is good. Mm-hmm. Um, the next move is this is a guy I would have liked to see the Ravens go after is Keenan Allen going to the Bears. Yep. And we can talk about the Bears kind of free agency as a whole. I absolutely love what the Chicago Bears have done. I didn't realize that the Bears were going to go like push their chips this hard into the table. Um, this has been, they've actually had a really, really good off season. Yeah. So now you're looking at a team with a running back of DeAndre Swift, who they signed from the Eagles. Yep. Um, this off season, Keenan Allen, which they got for a draft pick. Yep. And then obviously needed contract, but like cap hit. They could, but, they could, they could afford it. Yep. And then you have DJ Moore, DJ Moore. Thank you. And then they have their tight ends are already there. Um, uh, Cole Komet. and they signed Gerald Everett. Um, and so they got those they guys. They also have Robert Tunyon. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they've got a good team there. They went seven and nine last year. Yeah. Seven, seven, ten, seven, ten. Something like that. Um, and so I th- I love what they did to put this offense in a system where you got DeAndre Swift, who just played with a pro quarterback. Yeah. Um, just played with Jared Goff in uh in the Lions. Played with Jalen Hurts for the Eagles. Yep. And he's got good quarterback there, which should work well with Caleb Williams yep. coming as a new guy. Keenan Allen, who's been a great receiver for a couple years. Good jump ball, consistent catcher kind of guy. Yep. Like He'll be able to go get it. DJ Moore's now wide receiver, too. Again, I don't think either of those receivers are the guys you want as your one. But having them now both, both on the field, it's like, well, one of them has to be the one. Yep, and I think at least it's two good receivers. Their tight end group is good. You work on the offensive line, and now you finally got the system that I feel like Caleb Williams can kind of slide into, and it's not a big concern where we look at a team like the Patriots, and we're like, God, like yeah. if we get a quarterback there, that's concerning. Yeah. And so I really like what they've done. I really like this Keenan Allen move because it just says it's Keenan just being like, Caleb, I will be open. Yeah. I'm your security blanket. Like I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a veteran receiver that's going to be able to get open, that's going to catch this. Like you, you will get eight completions a game because you will throw it to me eight times a game. Exactly. Like, and, and I think that's really good to have. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I love that move. I think everybody's a fan of it. Yeah. That was a really, really good move. I would like to talk about that from the Chargers front real quick. Um, Chargers, what are they doing? Chargers have made no moves. They're just blowing it up. I'm going to gloat again. <laughs> I said yeah, this. you are. I said this. <laughs> Everybody was like, oh, Harbaugh, this is great for the Chargers. I agree Harbaugh was a great move for the Chargers, but people forgot that the Chargers were in a bad cap situation. They had yeah. huge cap hits in Derwin James, huge cap hit in Khalil Mack, huge cap cap hit and Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Joey Bosa, like all these players had huge cap hits and they had to do something about it. And the only reason I didn't like the Jim Harbaugh, I, I wasn't huge in the Jim Harbaugh move was because I don't think they're actually going to have the team to compete next year when people were like, this team is now going to go over the top. This team is going to get over the hump. <laughs> they they released every single player. on Yes. Offense. Every single one. Yes. Like it's Justin Herbert and that's it. Yep. And I'm happy they did that because I think they're gonna they're moving off these contracts. Yeah. They're gonna get some new guys in, and in two three years they're gonna be good to go. And I think that this is a great, a better way to rebuild your team than if you were just trying to like do one more year, one more year, one more year. Because I didn't think this team was ready how it was orchestrated anyway. But like this is what ex- I expected to happen, and now everyone's like, "What are the Chargers doing?" And it's like, well, they had to get rid of these bad contracts, and Jim Harbaugh is throwing up an amazing smoke screen. Um, for JJ McCarthy, oh my god, just absolutely fantastic. It's a master class, and so they can get Marvin Harrison Jr. and I think that's the player they should get. And that's more of a draft talk, but I just wanted to look at it from the Chargers' perspective. Keenan Allen, you're getting rid of his money, getting a draft pick. You need to add some more aggregate talent to the Chargers. Um, I don't hate the move for them. I think they really just need to move off. Well, the honestly, what I think, what I think the Chargers honestly should do is 
you if you can't go get because I'm I don't think Marvin Harrison Jr. is falling to five. I I I refuse to believe it as well. I don't think he's going to fall to five. I think, and most selfishly as a Giants fan, I think Chargers you trade out with somebody like either the Vikings or the Broncos that want to trade up and go get a quarterback. So you pick swap with them this year, and then you get next year's first so they can go get their quarterback. So that way you're just building up these first-round draft picks because you need young guys in there, like just now. Like you need immediate talent on this team. You need like immediate talent injected into this team now. Like there's no time to be like, oh, well, we'll sign a vet and then have him for a little bit. Like no, you need rookies. Like you need rookies to be able to step up and actually start playing. I I love guys like – Let's think of an easy pick. This is not like me coming up with a crazy trade. Vikings come up to five. Yeah. You trade. They get You get 11, I think, is what the Vikings have now in I 23. So. Yeah. Um, so you get those two picks. You just draft for talent there. Maybe an offensive lineman. Maybe a guard. Whatever. It's 23. You see who's on the board. I love if you just go get Blake Corum, uh, the running back. Just from replace Michigan. a running back. You, he's already familiar with Harbaugh. He's a he can be your four down back, three down back, um, on the team. So you got a guy familiar with the system, mm-hmm. whatever, and then try to increase the offense. I don't think you should draft a single defender. I know the team has had defense problems, but you need to get Justin Herbert some weapons there, or else he's gonna as the he should leave if this doesn't happen. He will never because yeah. he's way too nice. But he should demand a trade to go to the Giants. <laughs> um, anyway. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> We'll just move past that real quick. Yeah, please. Uh, Green Bay makes some good moves, getting Josh Jacobs and Xavier McKinney. Yeah, those were great moves. Yeah. Especially Xavier McKinney. I think it really adds another dimension yes. to their defense. I think, I think it was a really good move. I think it it is obviously uh, a bit of an overpay, but I think that's the point. They could afford that. Yep. Like That's the exact point. Like That's why they could give them the bigger contract. The Josh Jacobs, Aaron Jones flip is a little bit like, like weird. Why? Like, I, I feel like I think Josh Jacobs is better, but it's kind of like what was the, going from an A- minus to a B plus or B. Yeah, so it's like why yeah like well i guess going from a b to an a minus yeah so it wasn't like enough of a jump to really make a lot of sense like you already have him on the team why would you yeah like maybe it was for like slightly less money i guess but like it it just like it was a little small move but i do like it you get a more traditional like three down yeah like running back and josh jacobs you have some really nice offensive weapons there for green bay and of course their defense was of concern last year Xavier McKinney but definitely he's, helps Yeah, out. Xavier McKinney, he's going to be able to really... Because him and Jair Alexander in the secondary is really, really going to help any of these young guys that are coming up. Because Xavier McKinney's a leader. He's going to be able to do a great job. Um, <clears throat> he's going to be able to do a great job, like, really kind of bringing up and, like, coordinating that secondary, um, kind of being that captain from, like, that further back role. Um, working with him and Jair are going to be absolutely locked down. I mean, it's a great move by the Packers. I hate that he left the Giants, but I mean, we couldn't afford sixty-eight million dollars yeah. for a safety. So, yeah, I like both those moves for Green Bay. Yeah, really um, good. Texans load up a little bit. Get Jeff Akuda, Joe Mixon, Neil Hunter. Yeah, they've just they're a team that drafted well, and when you draft well, you have guys on cheap contracts and yep. you can go out and spend money on these guys. Daniel Hunter, I like. I think it's a fantastic move. Yeah, him, Will and, Anderson, oh, him. God. Like, it's a really good edge group there. Um, you have Joe Mixon, who can play running back. Very again, solid, three, yeah. Three down back. That's kind of what they were mix, mi- missing last year. I, I know everyone wanted to fall in love with the kid from Florida. Um, I forget what his name Damian was. Pierce. Well, yeah, Damian Pierce. Um, but he's not running back one. This adds a good de- running back dimension to it. And yeah. just Jeff Akuda hasn't ha- had the great start to his career that he was previously. But if he's going to be working opposite Derek Stingley, yeah. the good young secondary, like... He'll be able to work in. Maybe he's more of like a role player, but it's a very like low risk, high reward yep. because maybe he fully blossoms into the potential that we all thought he and, had. Yeah, and to be honest with you, the Lions secondary has been horrible since Jeff Akuda has been there. So it's not like well, Jeff Akuda got traded to, to the Falcons. Yes. Yeah, and right. then uh, he was on the Falcons. He didn't really didn't play that much at all, yeah. and then got sent to the Texans. Yeah. So hopefully this will improve. I forgot about the whole. Falcons thing yeah exactly um, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully he can revive his career a little bit there but I wanted to mention it because he was a I think fifth, fifth overall pick yeah he was like fourth fifth yeah. yeah um Chris Jones huge new deal in Kansas staying City staying in the city yep um I think this was a no-brainer for Kansas they, they City. they had to pay the guy he's like, gotten three rings with the team yeah uh defensive tackle is worth more than a cornerback as we'll get into the yeah. in a second yeah and they pay the big guy yeah, I as much as 
he as much as good as Legarius Sneed was for Kansas City, and he was like arguably like a top three cornerback this past year. H- having Chris Jones in the middle, he is the anchor of that defense. Like he's the leader. He's been there forever. He's the vet. He's still playing. He's probably a top, at least bare minimum top two defensive tackle in the league. Like he's still utterly ridiculous, an absolute game wrecker, and he is. He just needed to stay in Kansas City. They just needed to pay him. Like period. Yeah. Um. I think it's just good for team vibes. Yeah. He's been. He's got one three rings there, and you moved on from one. You can pay the one. You couldn't pay the other. Yeah. Legarius Need, of course, goes to the Titans. Yes. In the trade there for the third round pick. Mm-hmm. You joked in the beginning about how my disgruntled moment of the week would be why the third round pick is actually a good trade. If anyone's wondering how they only got a third round pick for Legarius Need, it's as simple as this. That man got $20 million a year. If you get a rookie like Trent McDuffie, yeah. like Justin Reed, who the they've had no problem drafting these secondary players, them being the Chiefs, you can get this new guy on a $6 million deal, a $7 million deal a year. It's not worth it. And other teams viewed the same problem. Other teams don't have the room mm-hmm. to spend $20 million, 64 or 60 of it or whatever is guaranteed mm-hmm. the contract. Like, I think it was 66 million. Gar- I understand where you're guaranteed. saying, where you're saying, oh, a third round pick is not going to replace Legarius need. It, you're right. It's not, but you can't pay him that much money and you weren't going to get anything better because other teams also don't have cap space. Like yeah. teams looking for Legarius need, like the Eagles, for example, Eagles can't pay him $20 million a year. Yep. Um, any other team, the Colts even, weren't probably a team that were interested. They didn't want to pay him $20 million a year. Like, There's yeah. a reason for this. Mm-hmm. That's why you only get the third. And also, um, I I was joking about that, but I was yeah. actually serious. Yeah. Uh, that it, it, is actually, it was actually a good move by the Chiefs because they franchise tagged him first so that they retained his rights so that way teams had to trade for him. They couldn't just sign him in free agency. So even though, oh, well, it's a third-round pick this next year, more than other teams got for their best players that just walked in free agency and we look at how well the chiefs draft a third round pick is like a second round pick yeah and like or they could use that third round pick then to package up in next year's draft to then like go get somebody that they want so it's like okay well you know what our our corners are really kind of or iffy this past year all right well we're gonna package this second and third and we're gonna move up in the second round and then we're gonna go get the corner that we want and i'll say a little Thing. The cornerback class in this draft, really deep. good, deep. You got 32, maybe some teams looking to trade back. You got the thir- a third round pick, a second round pick, maybe a next year pick. Package it up, move up into the mid-20s. You, you get, get, get Kool-Aid McKinstry. Nate w- you get your pick of Kool-Aid McKinstry, Nate Wiggins, Cooper DeGene, uh, Kenyon Mitchell. Yeah. And suddenly you're like, oh, oh. like this ain't too bad. <laughs> it's like, oh. They've got a really good young secondary. Yeah, you're like, this oh. is horrifying. You're like, oh, well, if Nate Wiggins turns out to be good, we just gave him cornerback one, Nate Wiggins. <laughs> yeah. Trent McDuffie. That best slot corner in the yeah. league. Justin Reed, who's been great. Oh, yeah. Well, Justin Reed, who they stole from Houston on a cheap yep. deal. Um, then they have, I think it's oh, I think it's like Nate Watson or somebody like yeah. that. Some random dude played great in the Super Bowl. Yep. It's like, who is this guy? Yeah. So I think for the Chiefs, it makes a lot of sense. Um, it is they are, or of course, everyone's like, Sneed is one of the best cornerbacks in the league. Yeah. If they just can't afford him. They can't afford him. Like, <laughs> That's this, how salary caps work. And this is how dynasties start, and this is yeah. how you don't end up like the Saints. Yeah, um, yeah moving true. On. Well, actually, next on the list, talking about the Saints, Chase Young goes to the Saints oh for $13 million a year. I'm sorry. <laughs> what what are is you the doing? function of doing a one-year deal? 13? What is the point? I know you're like, you're not tying him to a long-term deal. Don't spend the money. You don't. They're already like $70 million over the cap after they added $30 million to the cap. Why are you spending $13 million on Chase Young? You're not going to be good. You have the third shortest odds or fourth shortest odds of, or I think it's longest odds, of making the uh, the Super Bowl out of the uh, the NFC. Like, you don't need Chase it's Young. So like, it was just, it's so unnecessary. You might as well just pay, like, play a six round draft pick and like, hope that he turns into Aaron Donald. Like, like, like this isn't this isn't moving it's the so needle. So worthless. Like it's all of this to maybe make a little bit of noise in the NFC South discussion. Like this isn't planning for the future because it's no, like one year deal. It's like a one year it's like, oh well if he plays well we'll sign him to another one. Okay. 
He's already like in his mid twenties. Yeah, uh, just <laughs> I th- this deal. I saw it and I said, "This is the Saints. It's the Saints. Like you're in this. You're in all this cap trouble. You keep making bad cap decisions, and you sign a guy to a one year deal. You get to pay him the thirteen million this year and or next year. Like move the money, whatever. You're over the cap. There's no reason to do this." Just let the young guys play. The Saints have been doing, been doing this thing where they refuse to believe they need to rebuild, yeah. and they're just mid every year. They're Literally win. since Drew Brees left. They're going to win five or six games, seven games maybe even, and miss the playoffs, and it's going to be a problem. Again, we talked about it a little bit earlier. They don't have the, Alvin Kamara, not that great of a running back anymore. Jared Carr is not a great quarterback. Chris Olave is a wide Still receiver good. too. He's good. He's a <laughs> wide receiver too right now. They don't have any other good wide receivers. They don't have any good tight ends. I mean, they pretty much have Jimmy Graham. Jimmy I think Graham. he might still be there. Yeah, I think he's still there. But well, they also have the Mormon Missile. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and they, just, they don't have a, that great of a team. This is just so unnecessary. And like, I don't, I don't, I don't see what they did this. I don't for. understand. What I do see a team doing this for is the Giants getting Brian Burns. Yes, because there's a big old difference between the success that Brian Burns has had and the success that Chase Young has had in the league. Um, Brian Burns, I think, has missed like maybe like three or four games in his like four or five years in the league. And he, yeah, so Brian Burns gets traded to the Giants for I think a third and a fifth, I think. There might be like an additional one in there, but it's like a like a pick swap, I think, yep. or something like that. And he gets paid, what is it, $150 million for five years, I think, something like that? Five years, one fifty. Five years, one fifty. Um, I don't think that's fully guaranteed. I think it's more no, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's more like an 80-something million dollar deal with whatever, but whatever. Anyway, um, I think it's a really, really good trade, uh, personally, because the Giants have needed a pass rush um, basically since Jason Pierre-Paul left. Yep. Um, and he won a ring with the Bucks, anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, they've needed a pass rush because they have they had some decent second. Well, they ha- they still have some pretty good secondary players. Um, well, had by Xavier McKinney, <laughs> so sad. Um, but th- with Dexter Lawrence up front, who is arguably a top one defensive tackle in the league, along with uh, top one, uh, top one with Chris Jones. Um, him, Kevin Thibodeau, he um, he's been slowly progressing. Um, probably not the like incredible, amazing impact that people thought he was going to be right off rip, but he's been improving every single year. Uh, this past year, he had, I think, 13 sacks. He's good. Um, so he's a, he's a very solid and he's improving. That's the whole thing. That's what for side, I'm going to go to like a little bit of a tangent here. I apologize. Not that I have, I've gone on many, <laughs> many a tangent. Why every single year do we immediately label people as busts if they aren't? superstars or all pros in their first in their rookie year it drives me absolutely insane this kid is like 21 22 years old coming out of college has like four or five sacks and everyone's like he's a bust and it's like guys he's 22 years old can we calm down he's like what 24 25 something like that 23 he's even younger (laughs) he's He's like one year older than us Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. He's one year older than us. And everyone's like, he's a bust. We got to trade him, cut him from the team. And it's like, take a breath. Everybody said the same thing about Andrew Thomas in his first year. He wasn't that good in his first year. His second year, he was one of the best tackles in the league. Third year, he was even better. Can we take a breath? And also, why do we keep just putting rookie quarterbacks in a terrible situation? Stop doing it, please. They just need time to develop. Every good quarterback has some sort of time to develop. There are exceptions to this, obviously. Stop using the exceptions to the rule as the rule. God. Ugh, so infuriating. Sorry. Uh, but anyway, good trade. I'm glad the, Gi- the Giants got Brian Burns. Him, Thibodeau, and Dexter Scar- Lawrence. A scary front. Pretty, Actually, a very solid front three right there. Because um, Brian Burns is actually really good in the run game. Thibodeau is kind of like iffy in the run game, so I think he'll be able to learn a lot from Burns there. Um, still got Okereke in the middle. Yeah, um, I do think what's cool about the Giants, what they've done is that they're clearly not competing right now because they need to figure out the offense. Yeah. Um, but like maybe two, three years this defense will be still be there, still have the same guys. And if the offense can kind of catch up, then they'll have an experienced defense and they'll yeah. be able to have a good offense, Young, yeah. great defense, mm-hmm. and kind of build. Like I see, I see the vision. Yeah. I, 
five years of Brian Burns, 30 million is a lot of money. That is the concern. But the there. issue is that like the pass rusher market is already yep, exactly. broken yep. at this point. Cause it's like, that's just the, like that's realistically, that's just what you got to pay. Yep. Like it's absurd, but like you look at every single edge rush, like I, I can't wait till Michael Parsons has to get paid and Cowboys fans are like, no, he's worth $500 million. What are you talking about? And it's like, yeah, and you're calling Brian Burns an overpay when it's yep. $150 million for five. Like, it's that's just w- inevitably what's going to happen because, like, what you see in the quarterback market, you see it in the pass rusher market, you see it in the receiver market, all of them are going up. Whereas you see the running back and the safety markets are both crashing. So it's like, it's just like an ebb and flow of like how positions get paid. For sure. We were talking about the Giants, which you're obviously a Giants fan. Yes. I'm an Eagles fan, and you're yeah. a Giants fan. And yeah. Saquon Barkley became Goes a Philadelphia the Eagles. Eagle. Yes. And what was a shocking, I think, move, to say the least, to everybody. Because the Houston Texans were really in there trying to get Saquon Barkley, but then the Eagles offered him 13.75 per year, something yeah. like that. Like, almost fully guaranteed, I think. It was like a big ass contract. It was. It was a large contract. Um, but three years, thirty-seven point seven five to thirty-eight. Uh, that's like ten, thirteen, like a little under thirteen million a year. A little under thirteen. That's what it was. I knew the the three and the seven were in there. Um, but yeah. So let me be very clear. I don't hate Saquon Barkley. Okay, he brought a lot of joy to Giants fans in years that. There was not a lot of joy. There was not a lot of joy. All right. Let me be abundantly clear. Does it suck that he went to the Eagles of all teams? Yes. But if you listen to like his like his interviews and stuff like that, he doesn't hate he didn't do it out of spite. Because it was literally just the best offer. Like, yeah, it's ob- like yeah. Objectively, that was the team that offered him the most amount of money. Why would you not take that deal? Well, and you look with the spot, like most money, good offensive line, a team that values the offensive line, and quarterbacks in place, yep. good character guy receivers, yep. opportunity to win football games. Opportunity to win football games, mm-hmm. and you go back to kind of the same area that you played college. Yep. It's like, that's a no-brainer. Like, duh. <laughs> like, why would you not do that? Like, yeah. so, like, I hold no animosity towards Saquon Barkley. I don't think he, like, there, obviously there are the Giants fans who are like, I burned my Saquon jersey because he's a snake. And it's like, guys, like, he did want to be a Giant for life, but we weren't going to offer him, like, 37 million. Like, mm-hmm. That's just how that works. Like different because unfortunately the running back position is a luxury position. If a team can afford it, it's that final piece of the puzzle that can really take the team over the top. Look at the San Francisco 49ers. That's a team that had basically every single position filled. And they were like, hey, what's one last weapon that we can add to this team to really take us over the top? It's Christian McCaffrey. That's the Eagles. Do they have some holes on defense that they really need to figure out? Yes. But, and also one at center. But the uh, overall, they are a team that can afford that kind of luxury because they have people under contract. They have, they have a lot of young talent on uh, both offense, some on defense. Um, but they, they can build up a roster around Saquon Barkley, not as the number one option, but as a dynamic part of the not needing to be the guy, but just being a piece yep. of an incredible offense. Yeah. Um, speaking of the defense for the Eagles, they get Bryce Huff, edge from uh, Jets. Jets. Great, I think a great signing there. Um, if you know, like they've got they've got the one edge locked up, Josh Sweat's over on that side. Yes. Um, for now, but Hassan Reddick's supposed to be on the other side. He's kind of a linebacker, kind of an edge. He might not come back to the team. Whatever this is, it secures another edge rusher where you either have three edge rushers yep. that are good. One can kind of shift back in coverage a little bit more. Um, just a great addition to the defense there. Especially last year, we had struggled with some edge rushing. Yep. Um, the defense struggled last year, to say the least. Um, but you already got your two guys up front, Jalen Carter and uh, Jordan, Jordan Davis. Davis. Um, and I'm st- struggling with names today. <laughs> and uh, also, they go and get Levante David from the uh, from yes. the Bucks. And I would just like to say. I think that's a great fit because Levante David is not the best. No, 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 no. Uh, Devin White. You're right, Devin, sorry, Devin White. Yep. Um, <laughs> I was like, I was like, ah, I don't feel like David. <laughs> yeah. Devin White. Devin White instantly becomes the best linebacker yes. in the Eagles' room. Yes, absolutely. He's, ex- <laughs> he's experienced. I think he's the right guy. Like linebackers are hard to come by. Yeah. Um, there's not that many great ones in the league. They're an undervalued position, a luxury yep. position. But I think we did the most here to get an experienced guy 
in the room, in the position. Nicobe Dean, you hope he comes back healthy yeah. next year. If we, not, you can still draft guys. And I think it's a good player in Devin White to have there for other people to kind of work around. Yes. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. the problem before was the Eagles were playing two linebackers who had no experience and they were just kind of hoping for it. Yeah. Now we got an experienced one. And if we can work in some inexperience next to him, I think it, exactly. it works out a little bit. Because that's exactly what the Bucks did with when they had Levante David and Devin White. Levante David, the very experienced vet, and then Devin White, the younger linebacker that was able to follow him, like really kind of build up his experience. Now Devin White moving on to the Eagles. You hope somebody like Nicobe Dean can kind of like be next to him and watch. Now issue with Devin White, he's a very good run stopping linebacker, which the Eagles desperately need don't get me wrong he's going to be great for stopping the run he's not great when it comes to coverage but what helps is that he's such a good run stopper that you then can kind of feed in linebackers that might be better in coverage and i was going to say like a nicobe dean because nicobe dean's undersized exactly so it's like he might be better in coverage but he's not as great of a run stopper so that's where you can kind of have that balance of like okay well we know this dude is at least good at being a downhill linebacker we yeah. know that, period. At least we have that. So then you can work based off of that. Instead of just being like, I don't know what these guys are good at. They'll figure it out, I guess. And then Eagles go more defense here. Sidney yes. Gardner-Johnson. He's back. He's back. He said some things about Philly. Um, Which, I mean, he's not wrong. And also, I think Philly fans would agree with. Yeah. Yeah, but he's back. <laughs> um, huge move there. We had safety yeah. issues all yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. Some due to injury, but you just kind of throw him into the lineup there. Mm -hmm. I think it's great plug and play. Um, also, Kenny Pickett. Comes to the Eagles. They got their guy. Uh, <laughs> the Eagles are going to the Super Bowl. Kenny Pickett's going to lead them like Nick Foles. Yeah, I am extremely happy with what the Eagles did this offseason. I think they had a good offseason. I think when I, got, I saw Barkley's contract come through first, I was concerned because I thought we gave a lot to a running back. And then I saw that they were able to address a defensive edge, a linebacker, a safety, and then also get a backup quarterback. And I was just like, I'm sold. Like, I understand there's some like you are paying money to guys like Bryce Huff, um, Saquon Barkley and stuff like that, that you're not going to be able to get back. But I think they did a lot to address positions of need. They have a draft pick they can utilize in this draft. They can move up. They can move back. Um, I don't think this, like, I think there's a little bit of this notion out here that, like, Jason Kelsey's gone. There's a new era of Eagles football coming in. I really don't think it's that big of a deal. I think everyone needs to, like, calm down a little bit about that whole thing. Um, and I think this is a really good opportunity here for the Eagles to do some stuff. And I'm going to say it here because I want to be the first, a sneaky, like, the thing here is that Jalen Hurts' contract is really big. And if Kenny Pickett looks good in camp. Oh, and, I see what you're saying. It, like, I think I think the reason they did this, they did this with Carson Wentz. Um, like you got you think they're trying to snake out Jalen Hurts right now? I don't think they're trying to snake out Jalen Hurts. They did try to do that with Carson Wentz. I think they are saying, Well, there's this quarterback in uh Pittsburgh who's a little disgruntled with the situation. He's a first round draft pick. He probably he got thrown into the fire a little bit. Matt Canada, no weapons. What if we signed him? You know, a hometown kid should be pretty happy. Signed him. Sits for a year or two, gets into the offense, kind of gets the fundamentals back a little bit. Give him a crappy contract. Yeah, give him a crappy contract. Hey, you've been a great backup quarterback, buddy. And then what if Jalen Hurts isn't good for two more years? And you just want to dead cap him because he's gonna have a huge dead cap hit. And you say, hey, we'll play with a cheap quarterback. Can he pick it for a year? Band-aid it. Maybe, yeah. he's, maybe he's good. Maybe he's not. Yeah, then band-aid it in the next one. And yeah. then you can figure out the situation from there. And the only reason I mention that is because it's a big deal because of how big Jalen Hurts' contract is and how poor. Like, yeah, it, I'm sorry. Like, if you Watch the games. He did not play well last year. Well, and also, his contract hasn't hit yet, I think. No, it hasn't. Yeah, so like it's going to be a little bit. I think it's going to be what like this one... year's coming out. It's like it's fifty million dollars. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big cap. <laughs> so the reason I say this is just because it gives you a little bit flexibility to move off of him, especially for Pickett, who I think I I was not a fan of Pickett coming out of college, uh, despite being a Pitt fan, but he really got screwed going to Pittsburgh, man. Yeah, he really did. It was not a good situation. So that's a sneaky pick that I'm just going to sit like it's, it was sit on it for a couple years. But. All right, so you're saying, well, I've already I've already said in our group chat that if as this is as a Giants fan and as a Pitt football fan, um I will get, if Kenny if I watch Kenny Pickett raise the Lombardi trophy as the Eagles starting quarterback and win the Super Bowl, I will buy it. And uh an Eagles Kelly Green. It'll be an electric day. Yeah. 
that that Kenny Pickett jersey. I think he's number sixteen because uh, Gardner Johnson's number eight. So it's just just a disgusting looking number. It, on is, him. it is, but <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just excited. I'm excited to have him in uh, in Eagles. Just as yeah. a guy, like I, I like Kenny Pickett. Um, and so it's cool to see him go to the Eagles. It's so weird hearing you talk well about Kenny Pickett. Well, okay. We're not gonna <laughs> <go ahead. laughs> his my talk about his play is just gonna be. I'm excited that he gets to sit. Yeah, that's and fair. like play with some good talent, and then if he, I I do trust him to be a backup quarterback for the team, like I yeah. do think he's a top yeah, yeah, forty yeah. quarterback in the NFL right now, and I think he can play some solid backup quarterback for the there team. You go. Not as good as Drew Locke, though. <laughs> no, he's best quarterback, in the, best backup quarterback in the league. <laughs> Maybe behind him, hard on the sleeve type of guy. <laughs> um, going over to the Steelers, who Kenny Pickett came from. Uh, Russell Wilson goes there on a one million dollar a year deal. Because he still gets paid from the Broncos, and then they Justin like, Fields gets traded there. Justin as well. Fields gets traded, and they get Patrick Queen from the Ravens. Yep. and then they get Cordell Patterson today. They got Cordell. Patterson. Why I don't know. Yeah, but um, okay. I guess the conversation we really need to have about the Steelers, Patrick Queen's cool, sure. Quarterback situation. What are they doing? You think that's your question? Well, I know what they're doing, but like, basically, they're using Russell Wilson as the veteran quarterback, so then Justin Fields can sit behind him. You try to have Russell Wilson play out this year. You give him hopefully a cheap extension, maybe that, or you hope that uh, Justin Fields beats him out in training camp. So that way he's better. And then you just sit Russ and have a vet on the team. It's like, basically they're banking on Justin Fields being good. Like that's the big thing that they're doing, but they still don't have a good offense. Yeah. Can we, okay. That's what I was hoping you say. Like, can we talk like, there have been graphics of, like, oh, let's look at Russell Wilson's weapons this year. Wow, he's got a team. Pittsburgh Steelers do not have good players on offense. And I think people are, like, the George Pickens throwing people on the ground, the highlight reels, have given people this impression that George Pickens is a wide receiver one or a wide receiver two. George Pickens has not been that good. Like, he's had some really good catches. He's had some really good games. He's not consistent. No, and... Deontay Johnson just got traded to the Panthers. Yeah. So he, he's, he's gone. There. Naj- Najee uh, Harris is not good. He's yeah. okay. Um, Carter Warren? Uh, not Carter nope. Warren. Um, Something I know, Warren. Warren. Yes, Warren by his first name. Yeah. Um, but he's cool, but he's a backup run- Like So the running back is okay. Their number one receiver is not a number one receiver. They don't really have great tight ends. Their offensive line isn't that good. Like This isn't a good offense, and I don't <laughs> know why people – it hasn't been good. It wasn't good when Pickett was <laughs> it didn't drafted. change. It didn't change. It got worse because Deontay Johnson left, and we're all supposed to sit here and be like, "Yeah, Russ is going to fix the situation." This is a seven-win team. This is a six-win team. <laughs> Maybe just by the Mike Tomlin effect, they get to nine wins or whatever, and miss the playoffs or get bounced in the first round. Like this isn't moving the needle for me, and I, I, I think I think Russ is better than Kenny Pickett. But yeah, their fair. team has gotten worse. Yeah, and I know understand the reason for Justin Fields, but I just want like stand up for Kenny Pickett a little bit. This team drafted a guy in the first round, the hometown kid, the pit kid, who's in the Heisman conversation. Yep. They draft him, provided him with no weapons, a bad offensive coordinator. Every, the whole entire, everybody thought he was, he was terrible. No weapons. They gets benched for Mason Rudolph in the playoffs, like this whole entire thing. And then also, then you bring in Russ, but then make it, a, instead of having like, oh, we're just signing him as the vet. They bring in Russ and then are like, oh, yeah, it's a quarterback competition. It's like, what the hell? You didn't even give me a shot. Yeah. Um, they said it wasn't a quarterback. They said it was Russ's job. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, this is going to be Russ's job. You're going to sit. It's like, why? Like, yeah. I, because the second that Matt Canada left, he had a 300 yard yep. game. And that's and where, like, and that's what's so frustrating for me to, as, like, just a person who thinks that teams need to be managed better is you drafted, I think you drafted a kid who shouldn't have been drafted in the first round. But you drafted him with the pressure of being a pit kid for like a bunch of years, yeah. And then, um, and who who, who were, I mean, ACC championship for pit football yeah. was huge, um, for the city. And then you don't give him any weapons. Bad offensive coordinator, bad situation. He has a, a good game, gets hurt, benched in the playoffs, slap in the face, bring in Russ, lose Deontay Johnson. Like I don't know what the team's doing on offense. I don't know. Like and the like they. <sighs> Their offensive line is like a little bit better, but it's not like good. No, like the Steelers should dra- consider drafting in that position. Like it just, like, I, don't I don't see where this team. I don't know. I don't see the offense. I don't see the vision. I don't see the vision either. I understand why you go for Justin Fields. You got him for a six round pick. You want him to replace Russ. I yeah. see that, but I don't see why Russ is there. 
I don't see why you couldn't have just rolled with Kenny for another year while you kind of rebuild the team. But yeah. Anyway, our guy, Ham Sowell, Ham goes Sowell to, the Seahawks. to the Seahawks. We talked about this a little bit last episode yeah. because uh, we just bought stickers in the commander's colors and now we'll <laughs> immediately get, got traded. <laughs> get new stickers. But uh, Ham Sowell yes. going to the Seahawks. I think it's really interesting because. Yeah. Gino's not the guy. Gino's not the guy. I think well, I think Sam Howell just went into an awful situation and they were like, all right, we give up on you. We're drafting a young I, quarterback. I, Bye. Because I wouldn't like I He was there for two years. And he was he was good. He was he was leading the league in pass yards yeah, this last year. I just don't for a long time. What's been what's frustrating to me about Sam Howell is that like people are kind of like, oh, yeah, the stats like okay, those last but like they're not terrible. I know his QBR isn't good. He turns the ball over a lot, but well, because they had to throw the ball fifty times a game. He has a he has a uh yeah last season, he had almost four thousand yards passing, sixty three percent completion percentage, a little bit low, twenty one touchdowns, twenty one interceptions. That's not great. Um, he had Terry McLaurin as his wide receiver one, which is okay. Um, well, Terry is underrated, but yeah, like he. The issue is that they didn't have a run game at all. They would have him throw like 50, 60 yep. times a game. So it's like, yeah, he's going to throw some picks as a second year's like quarterback who played one game the year before. And then it's like, oh, yeah, you're the starter. Go. Yeah, like, I love this for Seattle. Oh, yeah. And I think like he could just look good in camp and be like, oh, we've got a run game. We've got a better we got a guy. pass catcher. We got a it's game. like, yeah, we're, I'm throwing to DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett, um, Jackson Smith and Jigba. Yeah. Like. They got a de- decent offensive line. They have a decent draft pick this year, so they can either they can draft on offense or they can build some holes. A lot of people defense. think they're going to draft a tackle. Yeah, like, they can draft a tackle. Like it, it, it's such a better organization. I don't to. blame the Commanders for moving off him because they have an opportunity to draft a generation. I, Sam Howell is in a generation generational talent. No, at quarterback, but, and they have an opportunity to j- draft one right now. Yeah, but like, man, it feels like a. That's a missed opportunity with him. It does. And I think for the Seahawks, it's a great move. Oh, great move. Who could have potential. Um, Baker Mayfield gets a big deal. Not much to talk about there. We we mentioned that a little bit earlier. Yeah. But, like, yeah, he stays in Tampa. That was good for both Baker and Tampa. I'm here for the the Baker re- redemption arc. Yeah, me too. We love Baker. Yeah. Um, talk about Sneed to the Titans. Let's talk about Tony Pollard and Calvin Ridley. Also the, the Titans. Titans, yeah. Can we talk about what the Titans are doing? They I, clearly believe in Will Levis. Yeah, so they they believe in Will Levis. They paid a running back. They paid a receiver. Don't they still have DeAndre Hopkins? They do, yes. Okay, so it's like a couple years ago, if I were to say DeAndre Hopkins, Calvin Ridley, and Tony Pollard, that would be a ridiculous <laughs> team. You'd be like, what super team has this? And then quarterback, Will Levis. And it's like, okay, I see, I see the potential. I see it. I'm worried about that offensive line. <laughs> so, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so this is what I was going to say is I agree. I think it's a great thing to show your quarterback. We got your back. We got yeah. guys for you. I, like, I will say, I'll give it to the organization. They're like, look, we're investing in you. They're doing the exact opposite that the Steelers did. Can I throw something out there? Shoot. Tennessee Titans building a new stadium. Is there this thought that we can't afford to be bad these next as we're years. building a new stadium and we need to even if it's gonna be <laughs> we six, need the seven, cash <laughs> even if it's six seven wins a year we can't afford that we need the yeah. money Not that they physically can't afford it but yeah, this yeah, idea yeah. that they can't afford to yeah. have a bad reputation going and then, into their new yeah, stadium yeah yeah and then just like the whole thing drops off yeah like for, like from you're saying like from a business standpoint they need to be at least halfway decent because how are you going to sell to fans in a new stadium? Hey, yeah. guys, we got DeAndre Hopkins on one leg, Will Levis, who might not be good, and nobody else. And nobody else, and our defense is still and bad. And we fired our coach. <laughs> and we fired our coach that everybody loved. And there's one good player on our defense with, with uh, Justin Simmons. That's it. So, Rabel went to the Browns, by the way. And uh, we're um, the, the, are you 2027 the, is a new 2027 stadium. also with like the largest rooftop bar like ever or something like we that. We got to go there. We oh, got to go there. Dude, Nash. Oh, oh I'll run it back. Run it back, run it back, run it back. Dude, we, oh, we, do we have to go during football season? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll make plans. We'll make plans. Oh, Jesus Christ, my liver. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think for the Titans, good for Will Levis. I'm concerned about the Titans cap situation in a yeah. few years. That Ridley deal is huge. But... If Will Levis is, is actual 
good quarterback. Yes. This could help out a lot. I got a little bit concerned about them competing with the Colts and the Jags and the uh, Texans in that division. Yeah. But I understand the vision. I am worried. Yeah. But at least I can be like, you tried. <laughs> you, you know what? A for effort. Yep. B minus for execution, but A for yep. effort. <laughs> um, and very word, you're going to turn into the Saints. But uh, you tried. Yep. Uh, Rick Armstead and Gabe Davis goes to the Jags. I'm just really concerned about the Jags and their wide receiver situation. Who, Calvin who, Ridley wasn't the guy last year for them. Gabe Davis is there now. Trevor Lawrence is going to get burnt out. Christian there. Kirk. Like they're just going to waste his like rookie deal. Like I just don't know. Like the, R- Travis Etienne, like is there cool? But like, I, I really, they really need a wide receiver. They're just like they're just one of the teams that's like they started off super hot last year and then just fell off a cliff. Yeah, and, and they, then everybody forgot. About Arik Armstead's cool. Like, I like that pick for them. Yeah, that's that's uh, a solid Allen pick be back there. They need to improve the defense. They need to improve the skill positions around yeah, them. It's just like they have okay. a lot to fix before next year. I'm not sure they're going to get to it all. Yeah, I mean, like they just, I don't know. They're just not there yet. Yeah, and then I'm going to get run down. Make sure we didn't miss anyone here. Um, Justin M- Matabuke Meta- goes back to the Ravens. Uh, yeah, he was, deal yeah, there. signed there. Yep. Um, franchise tech initially. Jalen Johnson gets a big deal for the uh, Bears. Bears. That was a great job by the Bears to yeah. sign that. T. Higgins corner. still franchise tagged. Um, yeah. He's That's supposed to get traded, but something to watch for sure. Yeah, he's something to watch. Christian Wilkins goes to the Raiders. Just not really sure what they're doing there. Don't know what the Raiders are doing. Don't know what Miami's yeah. doing. <laughs> uh, Mike Evans goes back to the uh, Bucks. Yep. Pittman back to the Colts. Yep. And Ty- oh, Tyron Smith. Leaves. Oh, to the Jets. Yeah, to the Jets. Huge deal for the Jets. Yes. Really trying to like throw some protection around Aaron Rodgers there. They are old. They are old, so they are they are gambling everything on Aaron Rodgers' ACL, yes, or Achilles, whatever, both. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but it, it's good for them. For the Cowboys, so you haven't heard their name a lot. And they episode. signed Eric Hendricks, and that's it. It's concerning. They didn't do anything. They and didn't change at all. They weren't good enough last year. Didn't they cut Michael Gallup? Yeah, yeah. So they lost Michael Gallup. They signed Eric Hendricks, who's fine. He's like a Probably a mid. He, he used to be a lot better, but you know he's probably like mid right now. I mean, Leighton Van Der Esch retired. Van Der Esch retired. Like they, the Eagles got better. The Eagles got better. The Giants got better. better. And the Commanders are probably going to get better. Well, I mean, they've got. I know Aust- they're not good, but they'll look. They got Austin Eckler though. Yeah, <laughs> they got Austin Eckler. They can't run faster than I can run. Can't really run that fast. So you know what? They're going to be good. Um, one mention here the. This is not really a big deal. Robert Hunt, which is one of the better offensive guards in the league, who played for the Miami Dolphins, went to the Panthers. That is a big deal just for maybe giving... Holy Bryce overpay, some, yeah. but they're desperate they to need, just give them yeah, some sort of protection. Yeah, give Bryce Young some help. So I just wanted to point that out as yeah. a that could be good. Wow, you solved one of the offensive linemen. I Welcome know. to the Giants. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys who are still out there right now, Stephon Gilmore, J- Davidian Clownley. Still, yeah, they're, they're still out there. Um, I think Zadarius Smith. I think went back to the Browns. I believe Willie um, Gay leaves the Chiefs. Yes, he leaves the Chiefs. Um, I know the Giants signed every free agent offensive lineman like ever. Like they signed like five. I think. I think they literally signed every single position. I think they signed. Or no, not every. I think they they signed a center, two guards. And one guard that can swing to tackle. <laughs> and I believe another. I think they signed five. It's four or five. I can't remember. But th- thank God, first of all. And to all the Fairweather uh, Giants fans that are like, what? why are we not getting Trey White right now? Our offensive line has been bad for 12 years. Let us have this for the love of God. All right? We need something. Sorry. <laughs> That's free agency. That's free agency. In a nutshell. There might be some more updates. There's there's going to be a ton more updates. There's a ton of people that we missed. And we'll talk about a lot of teams in more detail later. Yeah, we'll we'll break down each of the divisions individually and all that later. Just once once the draft happens and then once free agency like sort of like comes to like an end, we'll really be able to recap and like see the full vision of what teams were able to do. Um cuz this draft is going to be ridiculous it's gonna be fun um I'm getting, i think it's gonna be nuts i'm getting into all the draft weed right now it's been really fun yeah i've been watching film on people malik neighbors please come to the Giants, please 
It's been a long episode, but I do want to cover the NFL rule changes. Yes, I don't want to, real quick. I don't yeah. want to wait till next week to do it. Yeah. Um, the big ones of note. First one, hip drop tackle. Gone. Bad. Bad. I don't like this at all. Dumb. Um, I understand protecting player safety. Player safety looks like grass fields that have been statistically shown to be better for players and injuries. Yep. And not letting the turf fields be bad, especially certain turfs. And looking at you, the hip drop tackle is going to cause a lot of game changing fouls at the end of games it is going to cause experienced players to completely redefine how they tackle. Yep. And I just don't know if it's that beneficial and how much the hip drop tackle really has led to injuries. Realistically, if the NFL had any sort of brains, um, this would have been uh, put through in if they thought, well, here's the thing. If this the was players association didn't want it. If this was really about player safety, let's be clear here. Yep. Why is this only in the NFL? There's millions of kids that are playing football yep. every year. Why isn't it going in at the lowest levels? Why are these not going into the lowest levels first? So that way it's working its way up. So that way by the time that these pros get into the league, they don't hip drop tackle. If they really care. That's what they would do. Yep. They don't. They just want to be able to say... We care about player safety. And look, does objectively is the hip drop tackle like does it injure people more? Yes. Yes. Period. Like, d- does that happen? Exclamation absolutely. point. Like, yes, this absolutely does. Let's be very clear. But the way to enforce that is so subjective and odd. It's like, are you going to penalize somebody just because it caused an inadvertent injury? But like, how do you blame the player when they're clearly they're in their intent? Clearly, is not to do that. And like, you know, I understand we're trying to switch to like a, almost a more rugby style tackling where it's like you're really trying to wrap the legs up and stuff. But like, they do this in rugby too sometimes. Like, it, I just think I don't I don't know. Like, I just it, get I just get nervous about the flags flying around next year. We in, already in have too much, we have already have so many issues with officiating. We don't need more flags. Yeah, at least not at this point. If it was like officiating was perfect, and then it's like okay, we're gonna add this, so it'll be like. Okay, let's see how it goes. But because of all the issues with roughing the passer, because of all the inconsistencies with like pass interference, like it's already so hard to play defense in the league. And then now it's just going to be even more difficult because somehow you have to like take down somebody that's bigger than you without using your momentum and tackle them forward if you're behind them, but you don't want them to go forward because then they're going to gain more yards. But if you do if you do that the wrong way and you're not perfect, yep. they're gonna add fifteen more yards. So it's like what do you yep. what am I supposed to do? Uh teams gain a third challenge following one successful challenge. Cool. All right. Makes um, sense. If you have a double foul now with the change of possession, like a you foul, interception, they foul, the foul gets enforced as long as the foul did not pr- come prior to their possession. So for example, what? if I threw the ball. I intercepted. And you intercept it. And then on the return, you get a roughing the passer. Okay. You still get the inter- you get the ball, but the penalty is enforced. When was before, that not how it was? Uh, yeah, I think it canceled it out before. What? It's not a rule we're going to see a lot. Um, the, the rule says if there's a double foul during a down when there's a change of possession. Oh, so team... it's like if there's um, offensive holding, I intercept the ball. And then there's also roughing the passer. Yeah. I still get the ball, but then only roughing the passer is enforced. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. 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 So it's just, it's permitting that. Um, replay assistant will be allowed to correct incorrect calls for roughing the passer intentional grounding. If it's objective, that's good. Um, oh, oh, that's actually, why was that not news? That's good news. Kickoff stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and then that's huge just because if it's a bad roughing the passer call, they we can just review it. Review, overturn it. Yeah. Um, same thing with game clock expiring. We can do that now, which is not a big deal. Here's a number, uh, something designated. I don't know what that is. Um, trade deadline pushed back one week, which I think is cool. Um, but it wasn't pushed back with the extra week onto the year. And now it's pushed back. That's good. <laughs> um, clubs can elevate a quarterback unlimited number of times from practice squad for emergency quarterback. That's also good because quarterbacks keep getting hurt. Yeah, they need so that. So that's that. The big one, of course is the kickoff return. It's the XFL, baby. I would encourage you if you've made it this far in the episode and somehow, somehow, and you don't know what the 
the new kickoff return rule. Just go, go look it up. Just Google it real quick. Because I'm not going to explain it because you're not going to understand it. It is so complicated to try. Like, we would literally need a full whiteboard and it would still be confusing. But essentially, the idea is nobody is moving when the ball is kicked until the person, until the person catches it. Yes. And, and what that's going to do is going to stop high speed flying tackles, yeah. stop people running full speed across the length of the field with injuries. It'll also allow better chance for returns because the the front the return team and the kicking team their lines of players who are chasing are like right next to each are other. right next to each other and there's also a, way further up the field yep. away from the kicker so there's going to be this more idea like where everybody's blocking each other up front and they're not running into each other at high speeds mm-hmm. and it'll really be a testament of which line can make better tackles yeah and those players can run through there's also some things where you want to kick it between the 20s and not through the end zone because then it'll come all the way out to the 30 some neat yeah. stuff i'm really excited for it i think it will reduce injuries it won't be very obvious because sometimes these players kind of like limp off the field versus like you don't no one gets like cracked yeah. on the kickoff mm-hmm. um but i think it, it's going to hopefully increase the number of kickoff returns we have and yeah teams can get really unique with their designs like you could have some more like fake actions and stuff. Yeah. And also, God forbid, if it's horrible, they could just take it out next year. Who cares? Like no fair catches, I think is fun. That's fun. Like, so you have to return it. Yep. Yeah. Like I like that. As long as it doesn't get kicked through the end. As long as it's not kicked. Yes. And if you, and if you can kneel for the possession, it's a 30 yard line thing though. That's not going to be advantageous for teams. So I'm excited. I'm excited to see what it looks like. I am excited to see what that looks like. And obviously some people are like, Oh, well this is, this is so gimmicky. This is dumb. It's like, Okay, well, the kickoff was already like basically useless. Like there was like ten returns last year, and if you can get a receiver who, I mean, a punter, I mean, a kicker who can really pin it within the five, can really pin it, yeah. like really talented at getting it into the that area, Val- you might get like people like teams that are constantly starting at the twenty versus teams that are constantly starting at the 35, 40. Like that's a big difference, and that could like change games and possession. Or if and- you get a, a- kick returner that's really good that's able to break through these lines it's them versus the kicker yeah and then it forces kickers to get athletic so then now they're players yeah instead of being just kickers sorry pat mcafee <laughs> yeah i get more excited the more i think about this i think it i think it's gonna be interesting i think it's gonna be really really weird watching it at first oh but yeah it's gonna be entertaining it's what's fun is someone tweeted this i didn't come up with this but the first play of yeah, the, the first play so of the 2024 yeah. 2025 NFL season will be something we've never seen before. Yeah, it's going to be wholly unique. But yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And also, at the end of the day, guys, let's not forget it's a game. It's, a game. it's supposed to be fun. Like, I know they're professional athletes and all that, but like, who cares? Yep. 